Heritage Park in Progressive Field is flanked by plaques that honor former Indians' greats. So here we have the, the Ray Chapman plaque that shortly after his death, one of the things that people wanted to do was create some sort of memorial to Ray. But this plaque of Ray Chapman is a little different. He had a, a pretty solid career, but there's so many other guys that had very similar solid careers that are, are forgotten about. Unfortunately, Chapman is more remembered for his death than, you know, the player that he was. That's because Chapman, former Indians shortstop, holds the dubious distinction of being the first and only Major League Baseball player to die after being injured during a game. There have probably been about 35 million or more pitches thrown in Major League Baseball history, and only one of those pitches ever killed a player. Sports writer Michael Sowell wrote an aptly titled book about it. The title of the book is The Pitch That Killed. When the game was in New York, this is 1920, so they played in the polo grounds. Cleveland jumped out to an early lead, and in the fifth inning of the game, Chapman comes up, and on the first pitch, he's hit in the head by a pitch from Carl Mays. It's important to note here that in 1920, protective gear was, well, virtually non-existent. Players back then did not wear any type of protective headgear when they batted. And some people think this obviously would lead to batting helmets that players wear today. And yet it took about 30 more years before they started slowly coming into play. When the ball hit Chapman in the head, it hit him with such force that it could be heard throughout the stadium and the ball actually ricocheted back onto the playing field, and Carl Mays thought the ball had hit the bat, and he fielded it like it was a bunt through the first base. First base was getting ready to throw the ball around the infield, and they look in, and Ray Chapman has sunk to the ground, and there's blood coming out of his ears. It was obvious he's seriously hurt. He's trying to talk, but the words aren't coming out. It's very hard to understand what he's saying. So he's calling for the trainer, and Ray keeps pointing at his left hand, and finally, the, the Cleveland trainer realizes he's asking for his wedding ring back. And so that's what Ray Chapman's thought is as he's lying there in such critical condition. He's taken to the hospital. They performed surgery that night, but then a couple of hours after the surgery, he did die. According to Sowell, Ray Chapman and Carl Mays, the players at the center of this singular baseball tragedy, could not have been more different. The two men involved were polar opposites. Ray Chapman was the most popular player. Among other players, everyone liked him, even his opponents. Bright, cheerful guy. His father had been a coal miner. But in Cleveland, he got up into high society and he ended up marrying the daughter of the president of Cleveland Oil and Gas Company, a millionaire, and there was a very lucrative job waiting for Ray Chapman when he retired from baseball. And then on top of that, his wife was pregnant at the time. Of course, his wife was devastated by this news, and she later gave birth to a little girl, and the girl's name was Ray Marie, but she never really overcame this. Eight years later, Kathleen, Ray's widow, died after drinking poison. And just a few years later, Chapman's daughter, Ray Marie, succumbed to measles. And so the whole Chapman family, young Ray Chapman's family, was within six years, they had all died. And the fatal pitch was no less tragic for the thrower. Rather than focusing on safety measures to protect players, much of the blame for this incident fell on Carl Mays, who was widely disliked. Both men became victims of that pitch. Ray Chapman lost his life. Carl Mays lost his reputation. Players around the league wanted to have Carl Mays banned from baseball. And in fact, initially, there was some thought he might be charged with manslaughter or some other kind of homicide. Where Chapman was so popular, Mays was equally unpopular. Even his own teammates disliked him, and one of them said, He's like a man with a perpetual toothache. He always looked unhappy. And he pitched that way. And Mays had a reputation for hitting players. But as later stories came out, the catcher is claiming that Chapman's head actually was leaned over the plate and he was in the strike zone. So the pitch was actually a strike. Ray Chapman did not move at all. He made no effort to get out of the way of that pitch. 
So there's speculation, you know, it had rained, it was kind of dark and overcast in New York, so maybe he didn't see the ball, he lost the ball. The ball that killed Chapman actually remained in play that inning, and the Indians held their lead for a victory in that game and eventually went on to win the World Series that year, wearing black armbands to honor their fallen teammate. I think they really looked at it as they had done that for Ray Chapman. So rather than him becoming forgotten, in their minds, he was still, you know, very much a part of that team. So they even included him in the World Series championship picture. And fans haven't forgotten about Chapman either, even 100 years later. At Lakeview Cemetery, his tombstone sticks out. It's piled high with Indians memorabilia and baseballs, the object that killed him but also made him a posthumous icon. Saul can think of another way to honor him. There's a controversy in Cleveland, as in all sports now, over renaming the team. And some people would like to see the team name changed to the Chappies to honor and recognize Ray Chapman. So I think it would be very appropriate if they did choose the Chappies. <laughs>